All right, so it's Todd Atkins, and I'm back with uh, Miguel Adorati, and we're going to do another MMA Conspiracy Hour here. That we're going to kind of address um, PFL's Don Davis versus the UFC's Dana White in the news today. Um, kind of a little back and forth between the PFL and the UFC. And one thing I really don't think people picked up on, one reason we're doing the show today is Dana White doesn't tend to talk about other promotions in terms of their figureheads. Or really, he doesn't really talk about other promotions in general. He tends to treat them like they're a little bit beneath the UFC, and it's not worth even bringing them up. Now, he did do this a little bit when Bjorn Rodney was with Bellator. They had a little back and forth. But uh, I thought it was interesting, and I don't think a lot of the media really picked up on that part. So this is something I want to get into with Miguel today. And uh, <clears throat> Miguel, before we kind of get real deep into the articles, I know that you kind of skimmed over both of them. So maybe just kind of give an opening statement on what you saw in there. Well, you know, in my opinion, I'm not really impressed with the PFL. Like the last six or eight months, they've been in the media. You know, they signed Nganu and, and they, you know, they had their season on television and things like that. And I, 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 don't, I really don't feel the wave of, of support heading their direction yet. You know what I mean? So I, I think they still have a lot, a lot of work to do. But they've done, you know, they've, they've done more work than I did at Bodog. You know, they've done, you know, they've gotten to a certain level where now it appears that Dana is, is maybe paying attention a little bit to him. And I think that the recent signing that, uh, that they made where they're getting money from Saudi Arabia, I mean, that's the biggest pool money in the world. So, it, you know, that's a player that uh, comes with some controversy and some baggage. I'm not sure it's a great move for the PFL, but that's the kind of move that would get Dana's attention because that's a world-level move, and and, and the, the Dana is operating now at that level. I, I, I don't think, you know, um, that Dana in the last few years has done a lot of damage to what could have been a big legacy. And, you know, if you, now that if you're going to analyze him from the very beginning and, and things like that, and this lawsuit that the fighters have bought against him and stuff, a lot, you know, his legacy could be about to be trashed. Now, he's still going to die a billionaire or half a billion dollars or whatever he's got. So I don't think he cares. But I think that the idea that you have a, uh, you know, transcendental promoter there that doesn't make mistakes and everything comes out, he does, comes out smelling like roses with Dana is long gone. You know, this comes on the skirts of the news is something that I don't even think we've talked about yet. But also came out the news that they're suing pillow fighting. Is, yeah. is, is, is that necessary? Is that really, ne like, are you threatened by pillow fighting, Dana? You know, is that why in the world are, are is he's just he's just a dick? Uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, but we knew that from the very beginning. And now it's showing at a higher level. And, you know, I think it's going to affect his legacy. He could have gone down as a, you know, Tex Rickard, P.T. Barnum, Don King, uh, you know, David Stern, uh, you know, uh, Paul Tagliabue, like a, a famous director of a sport that took the sport to the next level. Like a David Stern is, is, is the example that, you know, what he did with the NBA was make it, you know, in every in every household. And Dana came close. But the amount of baggage he's carrying now and the way he did it, which was very mafioso, um, he's going to go down he, and not go down and like he's going to die poor. And, but his legacy, his the story of Dana White is that he's a he's a dirty blowhard, not that he's a great promoter anymore. Uh, now, I wanted to get a little bit into this, you know, kind of the PFL side of the words that were launched today back and forth. So one of the things I found interesting you know, and whether or not this is true, is he saying, you know, Don Davis is saying, we pay better, which may or may not be true overall. And another thing he said that I thought was, <clears throat> he also said, obviously, you're not under th somebody's thumb, and he's alluding to Dana White. What you do in the cage is what matters, not what Dana White thinks. But one thing, I, I don't know if this is true or not, I don't really have the, uh, 
history, but he said nobody has ever left us to go over there. You know, some of their guys have come over here, but nobody's ever left us to go over there because they like being in the PFL. What we're paying them, how we treat them. You know, they don't leave us to go to the UFC. But some of UFC's guys do leave them to come over here. So I thought that was I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, that he made those statements. And you know, that may be true. And if he did, you know, if that is true, that is kind of an interesting statement that he made. Yeah, you know, in order to go to the UFC, the UFC would have to be interested. Who who under the PFL has done something enough that Dana could say, you know what, I, I can do that on my Dana contendership. You know, you want an eight-man tournament? Yeah, I got eight-man tournaments. I can do them on the on the show, you know. So um yeah, I I I I the PFL may be a C level show in Dana's eyes, and you gotta go from a B level show into the UFC. So he's not interested in any of their fighters. And I I'd have I'd have to look at their roster and things. I mean, when they were weren't they World Series of Fighting? Yes. David Branch went over there, you know, Justin Gaethje, only only the best guys that the PFL has ever produced left for the UFC. So I, I don't know what Don's talking about. Just more more spewing, you know, information and, and, and trying to, you know, uh, you know, govern, manage the rhetoric and the words that are out there, but it's not true. I mean, David, there's off the top of my head, Justin Gaethje, David Branch, when they were WSOF, they went over there. And and why didn't you keep them? Those guys are pretty good, but you, you know, you went with Kayla Harris. So, okay, more power to you, Don. But yeah, that's a little bit of a disingenuous statement, but you know, maybe there's some truth to it since they're PFL at that point. But I, I think it comes with, if Dana's not interested in any of your fighters, then yeah, they won't be in the UFC. And I think that that's where Dana will comfortably fall back to is he's got other places to go get fighters. He doesn't even need to look at that show. Now, I want you to kind of talk a little bit more. I know you kind of touched on it, but this Saudi investment, I know you had some uh, words to say about that offline with me. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about that. Here's the deal. The UFC generates the money that pays everybody. So, you know, if that pool is shrunken and they take a, a small bit of it to give to the fighters, then, uh, you know, uh, hold on one second. Because, give me one second because... So whatever, however you want to slice it, the UFC generates enough money now that all the payouts, they make the money and they keep the profits. What does the P so the PFL owes Francis Ngannou 20 million? You know, are they borrowing money from Saudi Arabia or taking money from Saudi Arabia to pay him? Or did this last season of PFL on television generate $20 million that they've got it to give him? And to pay everybody else. So I don't know that the PFL is yet a, you know, they say they pay better in the UFC. Okay. If you're going to pay 700 fighters on average, what the UFC does, where does the money generate from? Is it investment money that you're now going to be eating up because you're not making enough? So that's what's unclear here. And that's what the Saudi thing is, is a little bit of a double-edged sword. You know, they give money to a lot of sports. You know, they're controversial in everything from Formula One to tennis to boxing to everything. And it's because they're flush with money right now. That is the number one pool of money in the world. So that's what gets their interest is that, you know, it's available. They're investing in things. And, and the PFL is a product that's edgy. You know, they can present it like a competitive UFC and stuff. And they sold that. But. You know, when that money runs out, are they going to go back to Saudi Arabia and be like, hey, can we have some more? Because I don't think that's the way that works. You know, and the UFC certainly doesn't have investors giving the money that, and then they got a pool of money that they're spending while it whittles away because the income being generated isn't there. Now, the UFC has diversified their income so that 
you know, all the money that the sponsors used to pay to the fighters for sponsoring them, they keep a piece of it now. You know, they've got chunks of everything coming in. So they've got a pool of money that there's a lawsuit out there that says they're keeping too much of it, that they're actually not giving enough to the fighters. That's not the PFL's problem. The PFL doesn't have that problem. They have other problems. Like, you know, they were looking for investment because I think in order to operate at a certain level, you need to have a pool of money. But I don't think, that, you know, I, I don't see them generating billions and, you know, million, even hundreds of millions of dollars in income yet. They're on small channels on TV. They're based on a TV schedule. In other words, when the season runs out, they take off and then it's like all the fighters are like, well, you know, where, what do we do? It's not even in the close ballpark. So the Saudi thing is a double-edged sword. And then then you run into, you know, world politics where this guy, uh, MBS, you know, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, killed a reporter about 10 years ago and, you know, was blacklisted. But because he is the richest man in the world, that's sort of been washed over now and everything's okay, you know? People ignore it. But what if he does it again? Or, or something more serious? What if, what if he were to sign on to a, uh, you know, military aid pact with China and Russia? Then the PFL may actually find it very complicated to do business with Saudi Arabia. So taking that money is complicated. And it also depends on how much you are, um, you know, uh, you need that money. The PFL needs that investment. They don't need investments. The UFC doesn't need investments from anybody. You know, is Don Davis, he, I think he's a billionaire too, right? Is Don Davis going to bust out, go to his checking account and be like, all right, let me grab 300 million here because it, it looks like that Saudi thing went south and let me fill that in. That's not going to happen. So this, this money, to me, is a double-edged sword. It puts them at another level. It puts them bigger than Bellator, you know. On an international level, it makes them a player in some ways. But it all comes to how they manage it. And I, I don't think it's a great sign at all, especially with such a controversial person. And then the other part of it is, is if there's any downturn whatsoever in world politics, you know, the... the uh, MBS's interest in sport may diminish a little bit. He may be worried more about arms and things like that and be funneling money that way. And then therefore in, in, in five years or three years, they may not have 300 million more to give the PFL. So yeah, show me, don't tell me where, you know, if you're drumming up investment money like that, it means it's not coming in from other streams. And there's a difference with the UFC. The UFC clearly has, more, you know, Venom paid them. You know, and all, all that entails, the TV stations paid them. And all that that entails. And they've got shows every week, not on one channel. So, yeah, they have a pool of money that will whittle away if they're not business savvy. And right now they have to show zero business savvy. Now, you know, you kind of touched on something Dana White said in response, which was, you know, you can only waste unbelievable amounts of money for so long. And he also said in, he runs a business and everyone else is running a charity, you know, and charity don't last. Although he is running Power Slap, which might be a charity. Yeah, you know, you got to take everything that Dana says with a grain of salt for a lot for a lot of years. He was a powerful uh, entity in the media where he almost had the final word in anything that was MMA related. But, hey, there have been enough chinks in the armor and stuff. You know, he runs a business that is being sued for being a monopoly and a mafia type of entity. So that business may be illegal the way he ran it. And he didn't have to run it that way. But he chose to. So it's all semantics, but that, that's the part where I said that he's ruining his legacy because, you know, some peccadillos can be forgiven, but he's doubled down on enough of these, you know, negative moves or moves that are so cutthroat in business that 
Other companies simply don't engage in that level of play. And, you know, at the end of the day, that that that's going to affect his legacy. You know, he's not going to be talked about like a Tex Reaper. He's going to be talked about as a, a cutthroat, evil promoter, I think. Let me ask you this. I mean, there's rumor that Bell Tour, um, the next Bell Tour show, I think it's 300. Is I believe that. I could check the number, but whatever it is, it's going to be the last show. And uh, that's in October. And then the sale is going to happen sometime after that. I thought it would have happened by now, but apparently it's going to happen sometime after that. Um, how important it is it that they get this done soon? I mean, because like you said, it's all about the news cycle. They haven't been able to break this news. I think that's important, you know, that they, they haven't. Todd, you broke the news. Right. It's right. out there. It's out there. What they haven't been able to do is they haven't been able to come forward and say, we did it. Yes. And and that's, this. it just looks bad. It just looks bad and it's an embarrassment. And then when you deal with, you know, and I believe they got a little less than half a billion dollars from, from the Saudis, right? And, and the UFC and, and the WWE have been valued at 15 billion. So they're, they're, they're so far down the totem pole in terms of overall, you know, money being managed and generated and things like that, that, you know, they better be smart with this money and they better blow up and, and, and show me what it is they can do. Because the things that Dana did right are that. Diversify so we can show shows every week, no matter what channel they're on. And these guys seem to be married to like, well, we're with this station and we're going to show them on their, you, but they, you know, they've got another hit show we can't step on. It's like, no, I need a freaking show every Saturday. That was Dana's attitude. And people have missed that. Bellator is so, 300 shows down the line, is so far down the chain of smallness that this is, to me, tantamount to a double A team buying a, a single A team. Many leagues below the UFC. Um, I'm, I know it's not 300. I wanted to correct myself as far as what, what the next number is. Not that it matters, but Bellator next event. I'm going to look and just, just so I can correct myself for uh accuracy standpoint here. Let's see what it's going to be. And I know I'll talk a little bit more too. I know we had an exchange earlier this week, and lo and behold, we were actually sort of ignoring another one of a, a PFL stream of income. And uh, I think I sent you a couple of uh, uh, you know, the uh, YouTube style clips and things that the PFL was generating, and um, they're a joke. They're a complete joke. You know, there's a guy that's an internet, you know, phenom because he's got a big ass. That's his deal. You know, I've seen him running sprints and things like that. Now, all of a sudden, he's in the PFL ring against the guy who th thinks he's a, a Goku character. I don't know. The guy, the guy literally kicks him with his hands in his pockets in the PFL's video that they're distributing and has a couple million views. So, they, there's a few thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah, Dana's worried about that. Let me trust me. I I don't know what they're doing. I haven't seen Francis Ngannou in a single anything from them, and they invested twenty million in him. But I get the guy with the fat ass against the guy who thinks he's a Goku character in the belt, you know, in the PFL ring, and you know what are we gonna do? And the guy is you no, know, he's such a liability at this point that we gotta follow him with you know EMTs and stuff. I got news for you. Why do EMTs need to be behind them? They're EMTs at every fight. It's it's stupid what they're doing. But if they got a couple million views, that's a check coming in. So I guess that's on Don Davis's plus side, right? It's an embarrassment. Everything that VFL does is an embarrassment, including, I think, going with Saudi money. But that's more of a personal opinion. But these clips, of there was another one with the big-ass guy wearing like a green screen thing behind him. And taking shots from another guy on a conference on a Zoom conference call with people. 
Again, a couple million views. You got hey, you got a twenty thousand dollar check coming in. That's freaking big for the PFL, man. It's a, it, 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 so that's why even Dana addressing them, as you notice, is is kind of weird. And it's even weirder because they, they aren't a threat, you know. So yeah, I, I think he's literally just so unimpressed that he had to say something. But the PFL is a complete joke to me. This is ridiculous. You know, I was actually right. It's Bellator 299 and then 300 is the one in August. So 299 is September 23rd. 300 is in October. And then there's none. There's literally nothing. Oh, there's not a single card you know. showing on the website after that. Nothing. Yep. And like I said, I bet you I, I, Comcast or whoever they're distributed by cannot wait for November to come so they can fill those spots with something else. I mean, I know Coker's kind of denied it a little bit up front, but there's not a single card after that. There's no matches, anything. So it looks like it's kind of lining up to be the end. What do you think about that as far as Bellator's history and everything? Like who PFL will get? Because, you know, there's about, I'd say, I was kind of looking over some, and I'd say there's probably about, you know, 15 to 20 interesting people you know, that they'll get out of this that could really help them. You know, most of Bellator's roster to me, you know, Alvarez, Chandler, you know, once you start getting deeper than that, the UFC got the guys they wanted. The UFC got the guys that I think it could beat at the highest level. You know, David Rickle, you know, God bless him. He's a tough, tough dude. But He's not a UFC level dude. You know, he wasn't going to be a threat to those guys. So whatever is left of that roster, yeah, the, the PFL needs to do weekly shows for the next five years and start whittling through these rosters and developing guys and making good fights. And it's got to be something done on a weekly basis like the UFC does. If not... You fall behind every time the UFC does a show and you don't. What I was talking about is guys like Aaron Pico, AJ McKee, you know, Amasov, who's a great fighter. Yeah, you uh, know, uh Nimkov, Usman Nurmagomedov, the Pitbull brothers, you know, they got Michael Page. Yeah, Chris Brennan. Patchy Mix, Lucas Brennan. Yeah, Brennan. yeah they, they got they got some, you know, I'd say about you know, and then they got a couple of female fighters that are pretty good. Inaba's a good prospect. She's undefeated. But I'd say they got about, you know, 15, 20. Got Sergio Pettis. I know he was already in the UFC, so maybe I wouldn't count him. But they got about 15 so guys. Here's the situation. <clears throat> we know what the UFC would do. Is is they take guys from, you know, a, a, a semi-competitive roster like they did, you know, with Eddie. And, uh, they put them into the grind immediately and let the let the guys, you know, guys that are good float to the top. I think Michael Chandler still has a losing record in the UFC. So how does the PFL handle it? Do they take those guys and make them stars again? You know, are, are, are they going to – they're stars on Bellator, so they're going to be stars on PFL. What's there to raise the level? The competition? When are we going to see them fight? You know, they, they've spent six months doing this deal, if they're going to do it. And this is the kind of thing where it's like, hey, you got to make an announcement. It's like, boom, here are the fights, and we're going to do, you know, Kayla Harrison versus the best PFL per or the best Bellator girl or, you know, whatever. They, they are so dropping the ball because it's like everything is like, well, you know, we don't they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They bought Bellator, and, and still they don't know what they're doing because they let Bellator run seven shows. Every one of those fights that happened on those shows since we thought this was going to happen should have been under the PFL flag. They should have grabbed everything and said, boom, we're, we're number two now. And instead it's like, well, we're not sure we're going to do this, and, you know, we got Saudi money coming in so we can pay Nganu, and, uh, you know, who's Nganu fighting? Is he going to fight the big ass cheek guy or the other big guy? Is that what the big announcement was? That the, the guy with the hands in his pockets, that's who Ngannou's going to fight? 
What is the PFL doing with these with this talent? Nothing. Nothing. And now who's got anywhere in the media? So yeah, yeah. They may get 15 good fighters that they can fuck up their careers, and then they'll see them go to UFC. Then they might see some of their guy. Then Don may not be able to say. The UFC isn't taking our guys. And it's like, yeah, David Brand. Like I said, when you go back in the history of the company before Don Davis, there are a lot of guys that are over there from there. A lot. Yeah, but do you and think if you include make a Bellator, difference? if you include Bellator now in this milieu, you know, you can go from Aspirin to Alvarez to Alexander Volkov, who I think is in the co main this weekend. Yeah. There are so many guys that are now in UFC and much happier. Even if they're being underpaid by UFC as well. Yeah. You know, ask Alexander Volkov if he would go back to Bellator. Well, obviously. He or now. And, and tell him Bellator was just bought by the PFL. Will you go back to the PFL? The UFC is a machine. I, I was talking to um Raleigh Delgado, who had a couple of UFC fights and um you know, back in, at the beginning of 2012. And uh, since then, he's taken a couple of fighters to the UFC, some of his students, including uh, Bryce, uh, I'm gonna, Bryce Mitchell and stuff. So, okay, so Bryce has had a nice run. Mm -hmm. And he says that even from when he was in the UFC to when Bryce Mitchell's in the UFC, the level of machinery going on there is untouchable. You're picked up at the airport in a limo. You're taken. Your room is ready. There's no like waiting around for your room or anything like that. They've taken little bumps like that out of the fighter experience, you know. And, and not to mention that then they're in the biggest show in the world, recognized. And you know, then there's also the, um, you know, the fact is is the UFC used the lure of Vegas. You know, a lot. Some people are you know, Kareem. Um, uh, I'm sorry, not Kareem, but uh, Nurmagomedov, the uh, 155 pounder at retired. He ain't a fan of Vegas, and not everyone is. But if you think the UFC doesn't use the lure of Vegas, hey, we're going, we're going to Vegas, you know, come to Vegas, spend a week here, and this, they're operating on all cylinders on the fighter package, and 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 the PFL just doesn't have. Then Bellator never had. So they're buying a company that never had, looking to add it to theirs and thinking something's going to be created. No, no. They need to operate completely differently than they're operating. They're already, they're, they're losing. They're losing this fight so badly already. You know, they got and got it. Woo! They've had and got it for four months now. This is a joke. Let me ask Today, you this. Now, this You've worked with a few promotions. Let's say you got this injection of talent. What would you do? The injection of talent has to come with a multifaceted attack. Like I said, the, the broken part, the, the part that Dana understood was you can't be married to a TV contract that limits you so that you're only on one channel. Because the minute you want to do weekly shows and they're like, well, you know, we got the walking dead that's hot. We can't get you a spot. You know, and I use the walking dead as an example. But uh, the minute TV has better programming, you're all you're off the air, you know? And 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 in the case of Bellator, like I said, it's been, you know, they're three months on television, then they spend a couple months off. Ask the fighters. It's like, how many of the Bellator fighters are sitting around thinking, when when is my next fight? So they bought a company that sucked. They bought a company that was not anywhere close to the UFC in terms of operating like that. And they may have Nganu that could say, we paid Nganu, so we pay higher. And, and we pay a million dollars for the tournament, so we pay higher. I don't think across the board they pay higher. You know, they may be using more of their income and more of their money as a percentage of, uh, you know, to pay the fighters. And that's noble. And that's what Dana should have done all along, you know. I wonder what would have happened if, yeah, and you were there, you know, we were there as, as people watching the sport. 
I forget who it was that got, I think it was Sam Stout. When Sam Stout, the Canadian fighter, fought Spencer Fisher in a war, I believe Sam Stout said he got a check for $500 from Dana White as a bonus, mailed to him, thanking him. And as far as I can track, I think that's the very first UFC locker room bonus. He threw 500 bucks at a fighter. In retrospect, when he's got half a billion in the bank, that's a joke too, right? But Sam Stout appreciated that 500 bucks. It was done well, right? But what if, you know, and then those locker room bonuses became 5,000, and then they became 75,000, you know, that whole track. What if those locker room bonuses were what the legal people in this lawsuit project they should have been? So what if Sam Stout, instead of 500, had three more zeros on that and got half a million bucks? Because they were making money at that point. And they started giving it out little bits. And it also came with the interest of killing managers and killing all that stuff. But they've got the money coming in. So they made the bonuses were for so long were like, the UFC is so cool. They're giving bonuses out. And now you look back at it and it was just a smoke and mirrors. Because they were making so much, and it's like, yes, yeah, throw 75 grand and knock out the best submission, the best fight, three, 225 grand. Dana laughs. You know, I just saw a video recently where Dana, you know, has been shut out of casinos because he, I think he made 8 million bucks in it, you know, in one bet uh, in blackjack. You know how much you got to go, you know, $100,000 bet, you know, lost, double down, double down, double down until you win it back. And Dana had so much money already that, hey, he could withstand the loss, the loss, the loss until it comes back and he bet $8 million and got it back. And the casino banned him. We don't want you anymore, man. Too much. And that's what, that's what the UFC is going to do here. They've got the money. These other people don't. Don Davis has money. And he's going to have money after this PFL failure. That's a lock. He's not going to go poor. But he's also not going to go down as the guy who took Dana White in the UFC deck. So certainly not. Not the way he's going. I think it's a good, th good thing to end on. Kind of a good statement to end on. Um, now, you know, we did mention the fight design. I forgot to mention at the beginning. So people that are checking this out, uh, see my promo code down there, Todd Atkins, uh, you can uh, check them out. They make fight banners and gym banners. Check them out on Instagram at Live to Fight Design. And Miguel, I want to give you a chance to talk about uh, the dog rusher you're working with. Uh, this is something that I'll put in the show notes on YouTube. Uh, we have a GoFundMe there that you can help out with this project. I've already donated some money to it, and uh, you guys can check it out there. And Todd, God, we, we appreciate it so much. I mean, you know, on a worldwide level, you know, things are, are, are in a downturn and, you know, dogs and, you know, people love dogs. Dogs are suffering out there, you know, in, in, in such a way that um, I've dedicated the rest, the rest of what I got going on to that. And uh, it's called the Wet Nose Project. You can look at us up on Facebook. Um, we've been up and running since 2019 here in Costa Rica. Um, we've got 70 dogs in a house and... You know, a couple of other locations with troublesome dogs and things. And we're actively trying to, you know, do the right thing by these animals. You know, they, they, they come to life because of the humans. The humans discard them and stuff. And it's it's just not cool. So to me, I, I'd rather help help animals on that level than, um, you know, people or anything like that. It just gets complicated. So um, I, I really enjoyed the work. It's the most rewarding work I've ever done. And uh if anybody wants to donate, I thank Todd a great deal for putting the logo out there and the uh, the link out there for, for some donations. They're all going to go to a good cause. You know, they're all going to go to a good cause. I was um, at the rescue today and, uh, you know, we were with a couple of the troublesome pit bulls and things. And uh, these dogs are living a good life because of the donations and because of everybody's help out there, you know. And and the efforts of Ashley, who's who's my boss, and and uh, the people at the Wet Nose Project. So th these dog rescues exist everywhere, and in the states, 
if you look at it, in the States, uh, Texas probably euthanizes 1,000 dogs a week. California, the same. You know, so it's like there's a blue state and a red state, and they're in the same state. They're killing dogs. And that's an embarrassment to our country. That's an embarrassment to me. So, you know, and in the third world where I am, it, it, things get worse. You know, here they actually don't kill dogs, you know, like that. Um, but you see strays and you see horrible situations. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting, getting good karma because of that. <laughs> you know, this MMA stuff is, 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 is a wonderful history and a wonderful hobby and a, a great background and stuff for me, but, uh, I, I'd rather be doing that. And, uh, people, you'll see kind of some videos on that in the future once we can, uh, get them done. Um, so you'll see some more of that on the channel and again check out the show notes on this and you'll be able to find all the information there and uh, as always Miguel it's great to talk with you uh, always great to get your insight on some of these stories and uh, for everyone watching this we appreciate the support of the MMA Conspiracy Hour until the next time uh, take care <laughs>